My name is Andreas Ferber. I'm a product manager from Azusa Labs for the ARM architecture. Um, and right now I'm going to talk about what's new with the Tumbleweed ARM ports. Um, as usual, short disclaimer, this is about software, so this is not a guide about what hardware you should be buying or should not be buying. Um, if you have specific questions for projects, um, do ask us um, beyond this um, particular talk. Um, then we can give you biased advice on what you think um, about that. Um, and obviously, some of those um, things mentioned here have been supported by um, hardware donations or help with particular um, boards from people or vendors. As a brief outline, um, I'm going to remind of um, the different um, dimensions of support for the ARM architecture that we have been working on. Um, Every year I have a very different focus point. This will be this time firmware and the spectra and meltdown um, security vulnerabilities that I will going into uh, with some more time. This year we do not have a hardware showcase here uh, and I will not have as many hardware um, updates, but um, still a number. So when we're talking about ARM and supporting ARM, um, we've already talked about microcontrollers. Let's leave that aside um, for this talk. So in particular, there's um, a number of chips that exist and there's new chips coming out over time. There's been new chips coming out since last OpenSUSE conference. Um, with those chips, vendors are building a number of boards. So usually there's a one-to-end relation between them. One chip, several different boards and several configurations. And then there is a third um, configuration that is becoming increasingly important as we are actually getting to a point where things are running stable and mature on the various boards is then you're not only happy if you're able to boot to a prompt on the system, but you actually want to, you know, like control a robot with it or, you know, do other fun things with it in, you know, the maker sense. Now, let me start by getting into um, the topic of recent security vulnerabilities first. Um, in order to understand what this is about, I'm going to talk about how the boot workflow works, at least in theory, on ARCH64 boards. Um, and then I'm going to go into a bit more um, details. So, AP in this case stands for Application Processor. So I'm assuming that to some point, we're getting to the point where there is power um, on that particular CPU. Sometimes there's like service processors or management cores that to take over that function, in particular in server class CPUs. But when we're talking about like single board computers, then in most cases, um, we will have a rather direct um, boot flow. And either the boot ROM, well, the boot ROM definitely does, but uh, possibly also an initial software component um, provided by the vendor or yourself would start doing initializations. Um, and what you can see on the right of this slide over here is that there are different exception levels um, listed. So going down from EL3 down to EL0. Um, and... Um, this roughly corresponds to what you would refer to as rings on the Intel architecture and maybe on the top you would have like SMM. Um, but uh, in any case, I'm just going to talk about 64-bit ARM here. It's slightly different for ARCH32. Um, and the next step would be... so. The rough idea is that the chip comes up with only minimal perif peripherals working and you don't have any um, external RAM available yet. You have the internal SRAM, the static RAM, um, and that is, well, a few kilobyte, if you're lucky, maybe megabyte or something um, that is available for initial code execution. And what you at that point need to do is to actually initialize the RAM that you can then run for the components into. So these are um, small um, individual components that chain load each other um, until you have like the actual workload that is working. Now this is um, in this case, um, as far as the ARM-trusted firmware, that's this TFA, 
um, is concerned if the default defined case is that this actually runs in EL1 and relies on services provided by um, the BL1 component in order to have certain hyper calls, the, uh, usually that's done via SMC calls, um, to um, provide a certain um, entry point that you want the higher level um, exception, uh, exception level to jump to code because um, once you've dropped privileges, as with, um, you know, as you might know from the user space processes, you can't just gain like root privileges again so easily. Um, however, if you don't have um, a ROM or component that um, implements those functionalities in EL3, you have no chance of getting back. So there's also an alternative way to um, do the BL2, and that is to host BL2 at the exception level three, where it then has the sufficient um, privileges to run um, all, pretty much all code that it wants. This is what typically the U-boot secondary program loader, or in some cases there's also a tertiary program loader, um, so a third one, um, where you have like one, two, three executing one after another due to um, space constraints for the respective code blobs. Um, or you can also use, again, ARM trusted firmware for this part of the initialization. The next step then is called BL31. And this is where uh, most of the runtime services are getting hosted. So they have the, the highest um, exception level, so they have access to really everything in the secure domain. That is, by the way, the, uh, um, the green line with the distinction SNS. So on the left side, everything that we are looking at up to now is in the secure domain. So this has access to special parts of RAM that may not be accessible from a non-secure world. And uh, this component is being used for um, um, power control, among others. Um, well, in, in particular, the, the PSEI interface is uh, what we're using from, uh, from Linux. Heiko, do you have any additions that I'm missing out on here? Matthias? OK. I mean, I know there are some other abbreviations that are also hidden in this one, but I guess they're not so relevant and not so uh, well known. So, at that point in the process, there is an option to load a secure operating system. And secure operating system, in this case, is not OpenSUSE, but is um, usually a trusted execution environment which is related to doing secure crypto operations. Storing keys, signing things um, in a way that is isolated from the actual operating system. And uh, this can then run um, at the kind of equivalent to um, user space applications under Linux, run some small apps that perform certain um, functions according to their API. Um, apart from um, Opti being the one that is being developed by Lenaro for ARM, there's also one from NVIDIA called TLK, as well as several um, third-party commercial ones um, that are probably not so relevant for um, boards running OpenSUSE. Afterwards, um, usually at EL2, we will have the actual bootloader, which then implements the UEFI interfaces, um, be loaded as BL33. And from there on, we would then be able to load, if we want Grub, if it's actually working. That's what I'll be mentioning later on. And from either uBoot, EDK2, or Grub, we could then load um, Linux, and I've been told that by now it is mostly running in EL2. There's also the option of having it run in EL1, but in particular, if you want to use um, hypervisor services like uh, KVM, then it needs to run in um, EL2. And obviously, the regular user space applications then running at the least um, exception level. Any questions so far? I know it's a lot of numbers, but these are actually numbers that on boards that do implement this, you will get a lot of debug output when it starts saying, and it will print out all those BL something numbers, and you know that it's jumping from one point to another. And I'll be getting to why that becomes relevant shortly. OK. So hitting you with the 
full scope of this. So um, in January this year, um, there was a disclosure that pretty much everyone should have heard of by now because it does not only affect ARM, it mainly um, originally was about Intel, um, that there are certain um, features in the processor designed to run code fast that unfortunately um, led to um, some security vulnerabilities used by clever hackers um, in order to use timing effects to read data that you shouldn't actually be able to read. Now, there are multiple variants um, in which um, this can be exploited. So the variant one listed here is a bounce check bypass. So if you have like an, um, if A um, is uh, less than equals than 200 do something, it would simply do it irrespective of whether or not that condition is true. Speculatively try to do this access, and if at the right point in time you would read certain uh, uh, registers, then you would have um, an intermediate value be available to code. Um, a second variant of that would be a branch target injection, so when you're actually jumping um, to code to get access to what you should not be having access to, um, as well as the more um, the the most impactful one with the just code named meltdown is when um, user space processes would be able to access data um, in the address space that they should not usually have access to, as well as an ARM specific variant that was then about um, certain coprocessor registers part of the um, chip. And what is now new since last week, um, May 21st, is a new variant 4, um, where um, stores are able to bypass uh, loads. The description is slightly longer than that. I, I won't go into the exact details of which bits are being ignored in the um, implementation from the various vendors. Fact is that um, those security vulnerabilities exist. Um, if you're running a board with a, low co uh, with a slow, low-cost core, chances are that you're not affected, in particular the um, Cortex-A53, which is very present like in all the all-winner boards, is not affected by this one. So the Raspberry Pi is not affected either. Um, but if you're running any, core, uh, any better cores like um, Cortex A57 on the um, Soft Iron um, Overdrive X1000, or um, more recent versions of the, the high keyboard, um, the Macchiato bin, um, and of course, a various server um, from, from other vendors as well um, are affected by this. And um, for some of those cases, um, it is necessary to not just update your Linux system, but also um, firmware. And in one case, even um, the, the secure OS if you're using one. Um, so that means um, in, or in addition to updating your kernel with the mitigations um, of uh, trying to avoid those circumstances within the kernel, it is also necessary to take manual action if you own such a board and actually deploy a new version of the firmware on that board. For the Raspberry Pi is pretty much the only board that we have an automatic mechanism where um, by doing a zipper dupe, you can also get a new firmware package that will then be used um, on board. But for any other ones, um, you would need to DD the component by hand. And well, um, if, you, um, if you're in the lucky position to own an actual server board, then you can get firmware updates from the respective vendor and you have a nice user interface that you can just flash them like you could you know, update the firmware on an Intel-based computer. Um, but if you actually have those small, cheap, um, single board computers, then uh, you will need to take care of that yourself. And 
for that purpose, we've started to collect um, the various firmware-related packages into a new develop project called Hardware Colon Boot in OBS, um, where also some packages that are not part of factory are being made available. In particular, the um, ARM Trusted Firmware is there. Um, I've also prepared some Opti builds there, as well as EDK2 packages for um, a few boards. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Then I'm moving on to um, the actual boards. What is new there in that domain? I'm starting with the V6 version. Um, so, the Raspberry Pi 0W was mentioned last year. Um, it is using the same chipset as the original Raspberry Pi, ARM11. Um, there is a uh, U-Boot RPI 0W um, build separately available. That is the one that I have been using. That's why there are still some question marks in there. So we have made a recent change to the way that we boot all the variants of the Raspberry Pi. So previously, um, there's the uh, um, binary and proprietary Raspberry Pi firmware that executes on um, the graphic core of the Raspberry Pi. And from there on, um, we load um, our U-Boot. Um, and so far, U-Boot was configured to ship its own device tree. So that meant that if you read a tutorial somewhere on the internet that said, you know, take the config TXT file, add some magic line that would, you know, make some hardware work that you wanted to use, that would actually not work because U-Boot would override whatever was configured by the firmware. And as such, you would have to, it was possible to use them, but it needed to be like redone on the, the level one, um, higher or lower, depending on how you look. Um, as I mentioned, um, I've been testing this with the um, RPI 0W, but in theory, it should work with the U-Boot-RPI because Alex Graf has worked on passing the DT from the firmware into the um, into the U-Boot bootloader so that um, whatever has been correctly configured by the Raspberry Pi firmware would then be available to um, our bootloader as well. And I have been testing just before this conference again that it is actually booting now with the um, tumbleweed kernel. There were originally some um, difficulties because um, certain uh, UART drivers were missing in uh, in the ARMv6 kernel because so far they had not been used um, and also there are um, there were some changes necessary for um, for the Wi-Fi chip which on the 0W is very similar to what the Raspberry Pi 3 does so it may be possible that you need to touch the config txt file in order to um, add some line step by the way. Um, touching the config.txt file is how I describe making the change, but it's not the most clever way. So we actually have an include mechanism there, uh, which is called um, something with extra in the name, extra config or so that is then actually included from the config.txt file so that the config.txt file can still be updated by our packages without breaking anything. Moving on to v 7 so at uh, the last OpenSUSE conference, we had um, the uh, um, Tourist Omnia router um, presented there um, using a Marvell Amada 32-bit chip. Um, by now, we have an upstream-based package for the uh, U-Boot Tourist Omnia. Um, unfortunately, last time that I was testing it, it was not quite working. Um, so I'll need to retest that, but at least with the um, um, downstream version with a few modifications. Um, I have been able to um, boot a regular OpenSUSE kernel by now, not just some self-compiled version. So this is working well by now. Also, um, th using the, um, um, the, 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 the switch ports, so this is um, not just a board, but actually an enclosed, uh, an, an enclosed router um, board. Um, it is possible to configure it um, 
not via YAST, there's still a bug, but at least via the kernel interfaces and manual um, text config files so that you can actually use it for um, connecting several boards to that or having your own routing, bridging, and whatever setup um, you may want to configure. I had um, spoken about the guitar board um, last year. A board using the same chip, the Action Semi S500, is the um, Sparky board. Um, the vendor has kindly um, helped test that. Same as all the other Action boards, there is no mainline U-boot for that yet. So it is not yet possible to boot OpenSUSE on there. And um, I have been working on getting patches into mainline as time permits. Um, but so far, only um, booting to serial console and an init um, RD is working. And on this particular board, I'm still seeing problems with um, the serial console. So I can actually read what the board is doing. It's executing just fine, but I'm not able to actually um, provide input to the um, shell on the init RD. So going to the 64-bit world, and uh, focusing on that, obviously, a bit more. Um, so what is new for the Pine64 board is that finally we can use the kernel default. So previously we had a contrib kernel, which was um, carrying a few patches on top. Um, now Ethernet is working fine as well in the um, default kernel from Tumbleweed. Um, and also the U-boot uh, package um, is now self-sufficient in that um, it includes a secondary program loader now, so it does not need any binary blob before that anymore. Um, the only limitation at this point is that um, it relies on the ARM trusted firmware, and we don't have ARM trusted firmware in factory, so that's why this package still needs to be taken from the Contrib Pine64 package, even though the source code for this is in factory. And I recently switched the uh, juice package over to use uh, this new kernel, so that is in the uh, Contra Pine 64 um, project. The Macchiato bin, another board that frequently gets asked about. Um, unfortunately, Marvell does not have the code for their chips in the mainline upstream um, ARM trusted firmware project. So they're like uh, two versions behind still at this point. Um, it was not immediately possible for me to do the backports for the um, TF side fixes for, uh, for Spectre um, based on that version. They've been doing that um, on, on their own sometime later then. Um, at the moment, I'm still waiting for the v4 fixes to be come out. But either way, unfortunately, um, the packages, the, the way that I have them prepared in OBS, are unfortunately not yet booting. Not sure why that is. Any help with debugging that will be appreciated. But um, U-Boot is available for some time. And if you simply use the U-Boot that um, ships on the board from um, Marvell on there, you can actually load, for example, from network or um, from um, SD card, um, a newer U-boot, and use the features that are um, available in there with some restrictions. And that is actually working so far. Um, so I've managed to boot into the installer. Um, at least the basics are working. It might be that um, some additional drivers um, are, are not uh, available or something. Has anyone recently been playing with that one? OK, Peter's not here, yeah. Then um, one of the first cheap 64-bit ARM boards was the Heike out of the 96 boards project from Lenaro with a high silicon um, chip on that. Um, I had it working with um, ATF 1.4 and was testing the um, Spectre mitigations on there, even though not strictly needed for the Cortex A53 it has. Um, unfortunately, with version 1.5, it stopped working for me. So there were some changes. If you remember the um, explanation about the various bootloader components, they switched from the um, BL, uh, EL1-based BL2 to 
um, a EL3 based BL2 and somehow in that process um, things broke for us. Although on another board I'll be mentioning that is not generally the case, so that remains to be um, debugged. There's a um, bug reported to um, Lenar about that. Yeah. So just uh, don't be confused. There is um, <coughs> a, a Juice Heike um, image around in uh, in a contract project, but that is. Uh, Highly outdated, so it uses some uh, custom kernel um, from the original days of uh, when this was being worked on by Lenaro. So, um, in theory, the Juice EFI package should be working as far as the um, device tree in the U-Boot package that we ship is up to date. Um, it may be that um, a DTP package or file needs to be added to the image in order to uh, make it boot. Um, the installer um, was not yet booting, so um, they have a mailbox driver that is needed for certain uh, power operations during startup, um, and without that driver, um, it was not able to actually reach the installer, so I'll need to um, adapt the installation images to include those drivers. The Heike 960 is the successor, which actually has cores that are, as mentioned before, affected by the um, by the Spectre um, vulnerability. Um, a similar problem here, although slightly different. It also um, changed to the uh, BL2 at EL3 and is no longer working at the moment. Um, and also previously, I did not have um, kernels booting from SD card um, on this board using the regular kernel. So using some Lenar kernel, it was working, but not uh, using ours. Poplar is another one with a high silicon chip from the 96 boards family. Um, surprisingly, after the um, um, uh, V15 BL2 at EL3 update, it is still working both for recovery and for normal boot modes. Um, U-boot um, is packaged for this and um, well, um, it has started to boot but I have not been able to entirely retest it before um, this talk still. Then a new board with a very Quick mention, um, the Dragon Board 410C has been around for some time. There was recent a refresh um, with the um, Snapdragon 820 um, chip. Um, this is using, um, same as the board that Matthias mentioned yesterday, the little kernel as a bootloader. Um, so um, in that case, what can be done is to simply chain load from LK U-Boot, if a U-Boot is available, which I understand for MediaTek it's not yet because someone would actually need to re-implement all the drivers for well accessing SD, EMMC, um, and so on. Um, this is packaged for the new Dragon Board, but not yet um, tested whether the chain loading from um, LK works, and in particular whether um, the... Um, UEFI support in Grubworks. So that was previously the problem with the uh, Dragon Board for an attend um, For one, there were some um, redistributability issues with some of the binary firmware blobs that execute before we get to those open source bootloaders. Um, and also, um, it was possible to boot a kernel via U-boot, but not booting Grub from U-boot. Then an update from the NVIDIA world. The uh, Tegra X1 based Jetson board that's using you know, um, an NVIDIA manufactured module, not just a, a chip on a development board that could in theory run on multiple carrier boards. Um, for that, the uh, 1.5 version of uh, Trusted Firmware A is actually working just fine. And it is affected by um, the um, vulnerabilities, um, so that is good news. I just need to apply um, the patches still for that. Um, U-boot is available. Um, 
UEFI unfortunately was not yet working and I needed to revert to the version R24 um, of the NVIDIA provided Linux for Tegra um, uh, framework. So that's basically, um, in this case, the, the bootloader blobs that execute before we get um, to these parts of uh, ATF. Um, but with that, um, kernel 416 and 417 um, are finally working fine on this board. Something that I cannot say about the X2 version yet. So uh, um, I've been having trouble um, even flashing the any any firmware at all to the um, X2 version of the board. So with the X1, no problem. With the X2, um, it did not work with uh, Leap 15. And unhelpfully, um, if you search for such problems, there's lots of forum posts that all say, oh yeah, just take Ubuntu 14.4 and it will magically work. No one really works why it works with a really ancient distribution instead of recent one, like of course our um, Leap and Tumbleweed distributions. Um, when using um, the version that NVIDIA ships themselves, um, obviously, um, UEFI was not working yet um, and the kernel was starting to boot but not actually finding the boot device so not really much to do. But um, as mentioned for another board before, the plan here is that if we have a UEFI compatible bootloader flashed onto the board, so not on the boot medium, then we can just take the existing juice EFI image and do not need an image that is specific to the board or the chip um, that it is going to run on. And that is in general um, a course of action to generalize the images more. Um, I will say a bit more about that um, in a few moments. Um, that uh, we need to consolidate the very rapid growth of images in OBS. Um, so Alex has been working on a very new um, Xilinx based 96 port called the Ultra 96. Um, this is packaged in um, a contrib repository um, for now due to some tools dependencies there. Um, U-Boot is actually uh, packaged in the uh, main line. I just didn't verify the exact name. Um, but it is there. It's using the standard kernel and it is um, uh, working so far as um, Alex has tested it. Which is uh, very new that um, this, this board is out for a few months at most and it's already in a state that um, something can execute on it. For one, that's because the chip has been around for a time and Xilinx has been working with SUSE um, on enabling it also for SLES products. But also there was a very good collaboration with the vendor of the board in order to uh, let OpenSUSE run as uh, probably the first real distribution on this board. If we're thinking of the chips access again, one new chip that has come out is the Allwinner H6. Unfortunately, last time I checked on this, um, U-Boot was still in very early changes with an early, early patch set and people were still using the FEL boot mode um, to um, try loading something via USB um, on there since the DRAM initialization code was not yet there. Um, does anyone happen to have an update on this in the audience? So if you're thinking about it, just don't confuse the Pine 64, which is working quite well, and the Pine H64, which is using a very new incompatible SOC that is not yet well enabled. And similarly, um, allow me to mention that there is the first Realtek-based single board computer now. Um, the situation with that, um, I had talked about that at uh, OpenSUSE Asia Summit and also briefly mentioned it last year at OpenSUSE Conference. Um, there is uh, a significant lack of source code for this platform, to put it mildly. And uh, I've been trying to, in some cases, just by trial and error to get parts of this mainline. I do have some patches in my... Um, in my GitHub repository, not in the mainline um, Linux repository, where 
um, by now, at least on the RTD 1295, it is possible to boot into um, OpenSUSE via um, SADA. So not yet via SD and so on, and using various blobs from the ranges to actually get there, but um, it is uh, possible by now, and it's mainly just the um, DT patches for describing RTD 1296 and this particular board that are missing. Now then, some uh, some other mentions. Let me start uh, with um, Michal has a talk about um, open source routers, and there is an ongoing crowdfunding project, um, the Taurus Mox, based on the Marvell um, Armada 3720 processor. Um, we have seen OpenSUSE booting on that yesterday, yay. Um, also using the same chip, uh, Matve has been working on running OpenSUSE on the Espresso bin. There are still some pieces missing in our repositories um, about that in particular for deploying the firmware. This is very different, unfortunately. Well, just like all the chips are very different from each other, um, it's different from the, uh, the boot flow on the Macchiato bin. Um, as such, it is not yet um, integrated into the OBS develop project, but it's on a very good way to get there. Um, similarly, with another um, ROC chip based um, CPU, uh, Matvey has been working on the ROC64 board, that's the RK3328. And uh, my colleague Yusuf has been working on the um, Firefly RK3399 and the corresponding um, ROC chip Sapphire evaluation board for the RK3399. Upstreaming projects, um, actually that is a typo, that should not be rock chip, so sorry Heiko, um, that should be real tech is the one that I've been working on getting patches into, um, Action Semi um, as well, that would be the Bubblegum 96 as well as um, the guitar and the Sparky that I mentioned today and a few others. Um, and uh, shortly after the um, last OpenSUSE conference, we received an FQ board from Fujitsu. This is using a Susionext um, processor from the um, Fujitsu heritage. Um, this, um, I have started um, writing the patches, but uh, they have not yet gone upstream. Then some very brief updates that are already touched on. So um, at OpenSUSE Asia Summit, I had given a more broader um, overview and insight into where we are with um, set-top boxes, in particular what difficulties are involved there. And um, here's a few uh, models that by now uh, have been tested to at least boot to some degree. Unfortunately, I found that it varies a lot between, even if they have the same chip and the same crappy vendor um, boot blobs in there. Um, it will vary quite a lot how they're actually configured. So on some devices, you will have a convenient way to actually load um, new bootloaders, new kernels via the network, um, or possibly even from SD card. Um, on others, that will be completely broken, and the only way to get something new on there will be a serial transfer, which unfortunately I have not yet found a suitable way to um, automate. Um, some new um, chips that I have been looking into but not yet made real progress. So just to give some inspiration maybe is the S905W, so S905, S9, S912 and so on from MLogic are already in the kernel, but this one is uh, new and not yet um, tested. There's been some hardware difficulties on getting serial access and the T926E um, I have started working on, but not yet having a proof of concept kernel to present. Similarly, using the same similar chips as mentioned before, um, so I have um, an upstream based kernel um, booting on the RTD 1296 based um, um, storage box, um, which is the same chip as mentioned in the uh, new Banana Pi W2 board. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of time left to talk about expansion boards. Just very briefly, let me say that um, for the Raspberry Pi, as mentioned, there's this config.txt mechanism. For um, other boards, there would be the possibility to not just override the device tree with um, a one that has been extended by yourselves, but um, in, in recent versions, we have enabled overlay support so that you can load a DTBO 
file to be added on top of the actual DTB file. And then once the kernel knows that this hardware is present in your system, you know, connected to those 40 um, 40 pin connector rows or whatever your board has in particular. Um, there's two ways to actually work with them. One is there's drivers like um, I2C dev and spy dev that make a device available that you can then um, use from a user space program to directly access um, the pins and write and read from there. Um, however, um, from a kernel perspective, that is not always desirable, in particular when um, various projects um, that are available somewhere in GitHub uh, will then start to actually probe hardware from user space, although actually you have the hardware description already elsewhere. Um, as such, there is what is new since last year, there is a Zerdev uh, framework where you can actually chain a kernel driver to the serial port which is useful for things like Bluetooth, for example, and you don't have to run any weird uh, HCI attach commands from user space anymore, or I've been using that for some um, uh, wireless drivers that were using some AT protocol via serial, um, and certainly several more use cases, and then there's a whole range of um, industrial I.O. drivers in the Linux kernel for sensors, um, converters of various kinds. So um, if there's anything that you need, we can easily enable the options in the Tumbleweed kernel. Um, and right, and well, you can either then use those I.O. drivers from other kernel drivers directly or um, use certain frameworks and tools in order to access them from user space. Yeah. These are some of the project that I'm still working on. So like um, sensors, if a sensor is not yet in the IO framework implemented, then it's relatively easy to do that yourself. Um, what I'm also working on is um, LoRa drivers. So I figured that um, it is not really useful to keep re-implementing this um, in various user space um, projects. So instead, I um, would prefer to have a socket-based um, interface to simply um, use it the same way that you would like um, uh, was it 802, 154 um, devices or you know Ethernet devices, uh, Wi-Fi, um, and another area that I've been looking into is industrial Ethernet. So where you have um, RJ45 connectors that are using the Ethernet protocol, but not the usual. Um, TCP IP communication that you would run on them, but rather some customized uh, protocols with real-time capabilities. Um, TSN is the new thing, the um, time-sensitive networks, which is supported by the kernel if you have um, suitable, um, compatible hardware. Um, but there's various other protocols such as EtherCAT that various expansion boards exist for that are then accessed mostly via um, SPY protocol. With that, I've rushed to the end. Do we have any quick questions? Okay. Uh, is the config.txt changes for the Raspberry Pi documented on the wiki yet? I don't quite think so. Okay, I'll have fun with that later. What, what change in particular are you, um, um, are you asking about? Uh, just in order to enable certain drivers on the GPIO, or so, like SPY, R squared C. So no, but um, in theory the documentation that um, is available on raspberrypi.org um, should be 99% applicable to what we have. So like, you know, we, we still need to configure the, the config text to load our U-boot, which is slightly different from what Raspbian does, or at least did in the past. But um, we ship the same DTPO files that are coming from the Raspberry Pi firmware repository. So those can just be used out of the box. And uh, there's no restrictions on that that I'm currently aware of. Okay, cool. For the questions. Okay, then, thank you very much for your attention.